Well, I do. I don't know if you have to love it or not. But uh, I am thankful for being a part of a church that loves to laugh and loves our kids. And, uh, and if you don't love laughter and you don't love children, I, and I'd probably ask you why you're here, but that's okay. Um, we're glad you're here anyway. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 15. And I know right now some of you are having a little bit of emotional stress because we're not doing things the normal order. You know, you're kind of like, wait a minute, we're supposed to sing again after the children, before the, the preaching, and sorry, I'm giving you just a moment to kind of get over it and, um, and move on. By the way, if you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, grab one of the Pew Bibles. They look just like this. Turn to page 1,112, 1,112, you'll find Luke 15, and, uh, and if you need a Bible, you can take this with you when you leave. We want you to have the Word of God and read it. Hey, a couple of thoughts while you're turning to Luke 15. Uh, first of all, just a building update, because you know we've been talking about how we're aiming for uh, getting in the Sweetwater campus uh, by Easter, and I found out this last week that that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's exactly how I felt, too. I kind of made that same noise, in fact. I think I groaned a little bit. And, and then God reminded me that, uh, you know, it's not about a, a day, and it's not about a location, that it's about the kingdom of God and his power to change people's lives. And we've been seeing God change people's lives here at McCulloch Campus for a long time. We're going to see God change people's lives at Sweetwater Campus when the time comes, probably late April. Uh, but in the meantime, we're just going to celebrate God's power. Wherever we meet, and uh, whether we have to crowd in here or have more room there, I'm just glad you're here. But I wanted you to know that some of you are seasonal uh, part of Calvary, and you were hoping to get in before you went home. My counsel would be just go home later. Uh, <laughs> so, because uh, we love having you here. Uh, but uh, hey, that that said, uh, one more thing. Uh, speaking of Easter and uh, and all, there is a movie coming out uh, this weekend called Risen. Don't know if you've seen anything about that. Uh, it's not getting all the, all the press that uh, some movies get. But it's about the, the resurrection of Christ and from a little bit different perspective. Everything I've been reading about it says that they represent Scripture well. They stay true to the, the text. But the, the story itself is kind of extra biblical in that it's about the Romans who are looking for the body of Christ after it's disappeared and the journey that they're on with that. So I, I mention that because it might be one of those movies that you're able to take your children, your grandchildren to and talk about if they can handle that PG level of violence. Uh, it definitely is something that you and your life groups may want to go to uh, or your friends and talk about. Take some of your friends that maybe uh, need to get back in touch with God. Uh, that might be a great way to start that conversation going. So I just mentioned that to you because it looks really interesting and there's not always a lot of redemptive movies out there that, uh, that we can uh, go to. <laughs> we go to them anyway, but there's not a lot of redemptive ones. So, Hey, that said, today we're looking at a family story that, uh, that is uh, what, probably familiar to most of you. Uh, and, and one thing I love about the Bible is that it isn't really filled with perfect people other than Jesus and uh, perfect families. In fact, the Bible tells us about messed up people and dysfunctional families and points us to how God redeems. And uh, so if you're a person who has it all together and your family is perfect, then you're probably not going to be able to learn very much today. But if you're like me, you either grew up in or now you're part of a dysfunctional family, well, God has a lot to say to you out of the text today. So we're going to look at some dysfunctional family fun in a story that uh, most of you have heard in some capacity or another. Uh, Luke 15 verse 11 is where the story picks up. It's called in your Bible, that heading there, the parable of the prodigal son. By the way, those headings in bold print above the words are not actually scripture. They're just somebody's interpretation of, hey, we should label this something. And, uh, and it is a parable, but it's not really about a prodigal son. It's about two sons, and they're both messed up. And it's about their father. And uh, so you could call it the parable of the dysfunctional family. You could call it the parable of the two, you know, idiots, uh, sons or something. But it's really not about just one, and that's kind of a little bit of a misnomer. So uh, let's just read the words of Jesus. Listen to what he says, and I hope you'll follow along. It says, And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. 
And so the father divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and yet no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And, and he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And the father said to him, Son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. What a great story, isn't it? I mean, just an amazing story, and, and what I really hope is this week, um, as we talk about this today, you will, you will begin to struggle with some of the things that we discussed today, that you and God will have a conversation about maybe who you relate to in this parable, about maybe some of the truths in this parable. Maybe you'll talk about them in your life group. Uh, you know, it'd be really cool in your life groups is if you share your stories of your homecoming to God. Uh, but what I want to do today is simply look at the characters in the story, and maybe we can find ourselves in this story. Maybe we can take the truths and apply them to our lives and see us changed, because that's what Jesus is all about. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at the rebellious son, the one that we call the younger son or has been labeled the prodigal son, because he is the catalyst. He's the, the initiator to the story. He's the one who gets the ball rolling, uh, if you will. So uh, the first thing we see about the rebellious son is that he is selfish, right? He goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. I mean, what a brat. I, I mean, can you even imagine this scenario? He is completely and totally disrespectful, demanding, self-centered, and surprised his dad gets it. His dad gives it to him. He, he takes the inheritance, divides it among the two sons, and gives it to the younger son. Now see this rebellious son, he, he wants to live life his way, not the father's way. And so he takes the, the money and runs. But he values the money more than he values the relationship with his father. So we see that he is selfish. And then we see that this younger son, this rebellious son, is also a failure. He's a failure. Because what does the story tell us? He went to the faraway land and he squandered the property in reckless living. So he got there and he was the party animal. He threw the parties. He had the entourage. He was having a good time. Now, we don't know. Did he start a business and it failed to? Did he make some investments that were bad? We don't really have a clue. We just know that he lost everything. 
He had a great time doing it, but when the money ran out, everything got bad. And, and not only that, but there was an economic downturn. That's what famines were in the ancient world. They were the drivers of those economic downturns. So they, the country is broke. There's no food. This guy's out of money. He has nothing else to do. So what does this good Jewish boy do? He goes to work for a pig farmer. Got to appreciate the irony there, don't you? You know, Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews, and so they hear this, and they think it can't get any worse than that. But it does, because in the story it says that the guy was so hungry that he wanted to eat the pig slop. Now, I've been hungry a few times in my life, but I confess, I have never been that hungry. Has anybody in this room ever been that hungry that they wanted to eat pig slop? Yeah, I didn't think so. I've wanted to eat a pig a few times. You know, but but I, that's like the bottom of the barrel. So he finally, eventually had enough pain. I should think about this. God gets our attention when it hurts, doesn't he? Sometimes the pain suddenly brings us to that aha moment. And this rebellious son had that aha moment so he was selfish, he was a failure, and finally he repented. He repented. He came to himself. He came to his senses. He you know, had that moment where of clarity where suddenly everything made sense. And see, here's the, here's the pattern in our lives a lot of times. Selfishness can make us brain damaged. We need to see that. We really need to be aware of that. That's why we need to fight selfishness. It will make us brain damaged. Pain brings us to the point of brilliance. And so he realizes, wait a minute, what am I doing out here slopping the hogs, wishing I could eat their food? My father's servants have real food. He treats them better than this. What am I doing here? It's time to go home, but I just can't go home and expect it to be normal. I need to go home with a different attitude. I need to go home and say, Dad, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I sinned against God. I sinned against you, and, and I just want to live as one of your servants. By the way, that's what repentance looks like. That's what repentance looks like. Did, did you notice he had this complete change of attitude and direction as he gets ready to go home? He's not trying to excuse his choices. He's not trying to gloss them over. He's not trying to hide his failure. He just comes clean. And, and he just says, look, I blew it. I failed. I don't deserve to be your son. You know what I've noticed with us a lot of times? I say us because I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Is a lot of times when we're in the midst of pain, we want to try to strike a bargain with God. Right? We start trying to bargain with God. God, if you'll rescue me, if you'll get me out of this mess, I'll do this. And, and we, we start making promises that you know, we probably don't intend to keep. But we try to negotiate. And here's just a little clue. God is God. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't have to negotiate. He's not going to strike a bargain with you. But here's the thing. Repentance leads to restoration. All right, what's the story? He heads home. He's got his, his speech of repentance memorized. And his father comes out and meets him. And he starts saying, okay, dad, I'm sorry. I've sinned against God and against you. And I don't deserve to be your son. And what does the dad do? He forgives him. Right there. He restores him right there. He's like, he starts calling him son. You were lost. Now you're found. We're going to throw a party. It's all good. You're home. Repentance leads to restoration. Not because we deserve it, but because God forgives us. That's amazing grace. That's why your path to victory is through repentance. It's by coming home and recognizing that you've been a failure and admitting that and stop trying to excuse it. Just own it and experience that grace of the Father as you come home. Now, a lot of us in this room have experienced the joy and relief of coming home, and, and we've discovered the, the Father has received us with open arms. It's been a wonderful surprise. But I also think some of us have come home, and, and we've rehearsed the speech of repentance so well that we missed out on the restoration. I, I think there's some of us that come home, and we missed the whole part where the Father said, you're, you're not a slave, you're my child. 
And, and, and you might come home with the attitude of being a servant, but I, I'm restoring you to the fullness of your position. And I think a lot of us are so wrapped up in our guilt and our shame of the failure that we forget that there's a party going on. And we're living as second-class citizens when we've been given a first-class ticket. And God has declared us children, and we're still living like we're servants. Just something to think about. See, that's the rebellious son. Selfish, a failure, and then he repents. Let's talk about the judgmental son. Now, you might have been thinking they'd get, have another name for him, like the older son or the good son or whatever. But really, when it boils down to when you look at this one, he's just the judgmental son. Now, when you start off looking at him, it looks good because he's faithful. He's faithful. I mean, he really is. He, he, he tells you all about it, that he's the perfect son. I've stayed home. I've worked hard. I never ruined your reputation. I never wasted your resources. I didn't do any of this stuff. I was exactly what you wanted me to be. He's the good son. Does all the right things, all the right ways. And from his outward appearances, he really is the perfect boy. But not only is he faithful, but he's also angry. Did you catch that? Verse 28, but he was angry and refused to go in, refused to join the celebration. He's angry. You ever wonder what he's angry at? I mean, he's angry at his brother coming home because his idiot brother should just stayed away, right? You took the, the inheritance, you, you know, wrecked dad's reputation, you went away, and we were better off without you. But he's also angry at his dad for throwing a party. Isn't that what he says? How in the world can you throw a party for him? How can you kill the fattened calf for him? I mean, look what a loser he is. And he's angry at his dad for blessing his brother in the first place. Because he took our resources and wasted them on prostitutes. Um, when you look at, at this brother, who is he really judging? Who's he judging? He's judging his dad, isn't he? He's judging his father. His father was too generous. His father was too forgiving. His father is too frivolous. And so he's not about to go into that party for his brother, that son of yours. He doesn't even call him his brother. That son of yours. He's just livid. Um, do you ever feel that life isn't fair? Um. I mean, you play by the rules, and you keep your nose clean, and, and you're a good Christian, and yet other people who are less deserving get blessed. Does that ever get under your skin, irritate you a little bit? See, if it does, <laughs> hey, somebody got the whole repentance confession thing down here. <laughs> See, here's the thing. When, when we feel that way, just understand the Bible calls that envy. And it's rooted in our pride because we're actually looking at people thinking that we're better than them, more deserving than them. But sometimes if we're brutally honest, um, we think God gets it wrong. When we look at the world around us, we think it shouldn't be this way. God should do this and God should do that. And we start judging God. Like, for instance, wouldn't it be better if only Christians won the lottery, <laughs> right? Just saying. We don't even have to play. We just win. That'd be really cool, huh? Of course, if I was in charge, only pastors would win the lottery, but so I'm not in charge. Or wouldn't it be better if, you know, like only terrorists got cancer? Yeah, see, some of you are starting to go, hey, these are good ideas. Let's get a petition up. No, let's not. Bad stuff happens to people who want to be God uh, in the Bible. So, you know, sometimes we just think God gets it wrong. I mean, after all, we love Jesus, so we should live at Disneyland. While all those liars and cheats and lazy, good-for-nothing, unpatriotic, immoral, greedy people, they should just go to Gila Bend <laughs> in the summertime. In the wintertime, they can go to Hel Helena. So... That's in Montana, in case you didn't know that. So, uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed in, in my years of ministry is that there's a lot of people filling our churches across this country 
who see themselves as faithful, who are checking the boxes, who are trying to do the right things, and yet they're also really angry. They're angry at God because their life hasn't worked out the way they think it should. They're, they're angry because they think that life isn't really unfair, that other, the wrong people are getting blessed. And they're living out that angry, uh, anger, and, and it, it just poisons their life, and they miss out on the party. How do they get there? Because the judgmental son was faithful, and he was angry, and he was unaware of grace. Unaware of grace. Uh, I don't know if you caught this in the story, but the judgmental son owned it all. At the beginning of the story, it says the father divided his inheritance, which means that both sons got their inheritance. At the end of the story, the father reminds him, everything I have is yours. It belongs to you. And yet the, the older son didn't recognize that because he complained, right? All this time I've been slaving away in your fields. I've been a good son. I haven't done all this stuff. And you didn't even give me one lousy goat to have a party with my friends. The dad's like, what are you talking about? You own the goats. You could have had a goat anytime you want. You could have had the fattened calf anytime you want. It's all yours. And, and he was unaware of that. He lived with the father, but he didn't really know the father. He was faithful, but he didn't share the Father's values. Think about that. Where's the love? Where's the mercy? Where's the joy that we see in the dad? It's not there. It's not in the, the judgmental son's heart. He, he was close to the Father, but he was clueless. In fact, he was just as clueless as his rebellious younger brother that he was living on the generosity of the Father. Everything he had, the father had given him. It was all his, but he was unaware of it. You see, his brother valued money more than the relationship with the father. But the judgmental son valued being right more than he valued the relationship with his dad. So I wonder how many of us are missing out on God's party. Just the joy of grace because we're angry and we're unaware of God's mercy towards us. I mean, we're, we're living our life, maybe this is one of the tragedies, we're living our life thinking that we represent God because we carry around that label that says Christian. And yet we're not representing the Father's values to the world. Maybe that's why sometimes he's unappealing to the world. Because we're misrepresenting the Father. So the judgmental brother was faithful, he was angry, and he was unaware of grace. Finally, let's look at the loving father. The loving father. I mean, it is Valentine's Day. We've got to have somebody in the story who loves. Now, I don't know if you caught this or not, but it's really obvious uh, at a second, third, 50th reading, the, the father represents God. Okay? The father in the story illustrates how God relates to us. I don't think the story is meant to be a primer for parenting. Okay, there's lots of scriptures that tell us how to be great godly parents, but I'm not sure the story is really the model. So I'm just going to tell you why. Because first of all, we see that the loving father was generous. And he was generous to a fault. I mean, think about this. The father gave the inheritance to his son. So his son comes to him and says, Dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. And when do you normally get an inheritance? Yeah, somebody's dead, right? So in essence, this kid is saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. I want my money, just like if you were dead. Now, I can't imagine a ruder, more disrespectful statement from John. In fact, I look around this room, and I'm pretty sure that if you had one of your children come to you with that same demanding, petulant, uh, brat kind of approach and said, I want my inheritance now, I don't think there's one of you in this room that busts out your checkbook. Right? A am I wrong? A anybody want to say, hey, no, I'll be that parent. 
Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you would do what I would do. is like, hey, there's the door. Don't let it hit you. <laughs> On your way out. And then you'd call your attorney and go, I need to redo my will. Because <laughs> I'm going to write this uh, ungrateful, you know, unappreciative brat right out of it. I, I mean, that, that's kind of how I feel. But I'm thinking when I read the story, uh, why did he give him the money? Because we wouldn't do that. And yet in the story, the father uh, gave the son his inheritance, even though he didn't have to, even though it went against the culture and common sense. Just like God does with us. God has blessed every single one of us more than we deserve. God has blessed us more than we deserve. I mean, think about it. He's given us life. And yet, because of sin, every one of us deserves death. And yet, here we sit, breathing, functioning, living. It's a gift. We don't deserve it. He's given us health. You may not like yours, but you're still here. You're alive. You're kicking. He's given you energy. He's given you intelligence. He's given you opportunities. He's given you food, shelter, clothing. He's given you people to love and to care for. He's given you those things. And here's the thing, he doesn't owe us any of it. He, he doesn't owe us that. And yet he gives it, to, gives it to us even when we are the selfish, demanding brats. This is inconceivable, but he gives it to us. He blesses us even when he knows we're going to waste it in reckless living. He gives it to us even when he knows we're going to be idiots with it. That's generosity. And, and I pray today that you can see God's generosity towards you. I hope you can see it. That God has poured his blessings into your life way more than you deserve. And, and see, the, the temptation is for us to be ungrateful because what do we do? We tend to look up the food chain at people who have more and ask, why don't I have that? Instead of looking down the food chain and saying, why do I have so much more than they do? By the way, if you look at the whole world, there's only 1% of the people who have more than you. And 98% have less. You see, we all have been blessed more than we deserve. The Father is generous and he's been generous to us. In fact, in the book of James, chapter 1, it says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father, uh, in whom there is no shifting shadow. In other words, everything that's good in your life, God gave to you. You're living on His generosity. Is that reflected in your gratitude? Day-to-day -day life? I really pray that you can see God's generosity towards you. Because the Father was generous and the Father was patient. He was patient. He was, he was hopeful. He was waiting. He saw that his son coming home from a far distance, and he ran out to him to greet him. He wanted his son to come home, just like God does with us. God is patient toward us. God is patient toward me. I, you know, I've been a follower of Jesus for about 44 years, and I am amazed at God's patience with me. Uh, God didn't give up on working in my life during my times of rebellion, defiance, or disobedience. Uh, God didn't disown me when I ran away from him or disregarded him or disrespected him. God didn't smash me like a bug when I deserved to be smashed. Instead, God has been patient, waiting for me to come home, whether that time is five minutes or five decades. God is patiently waiting for us to come home. So the Father is generous, and the Father is patient, and the Father is gracious. He ran to his son, his rebellious son, who had wasted his, his resources. And while the son was repenting, right? Father, I don't deserve to be your son. I sinned against God. I sinned against you. I just want to be your slave. What's he doing? He tells his servants, go bring the robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet. He hugs his son. He kisses his son who smells like pig pen. 
He restores his son. Complete forgiveness. Undeserved forgiveness. And yet he pours it out on him. And then he throws a party. We have to celebrate. Because my son who was lost is found. Um, you know what that means? And I really hope you get this. No matter how you've wasted the father's resources... No matter how rebellious or judgmental or selfish or arrogant you have been, grace is what you will get when you come home. Grace is waiting for you when you come home. Now, there's some of you that the pain of life has brought you to the brink of coming home. You're sitting here today and you're thinking, I man, I want to come home, but I'm a little nervous about coming home because I'm not sure what I'm going to get. Because maybe you were like me growing up, you know, where if I got in trouble at school, I was going to really pay double for it when I got home. You know, if I got in trouble out in the community when I came home, uh, I wasn't going to get a robe or a ring or shoes. I was going to get another article of clothing that holds your pants up. Uh, And uh, and some of you grew up in that same... So sometimes we're thinking, is God ticked at me? Is he angry at me? Is there going to be punishment and pain when I come home? No. The Father is waiting to embrace you, to restore you, to bless you, to throw a party celebrating the fact that you recognize who you are and who he is and you come home. See, the truth is, if you come home, God will celebrate. He will celebrate. I mean, the the kind of thing that all this stuff is happening around the end of this is a party. Because one son came home and one son won't join. And if you come home today, if you come home tomorrow, whenever you come home, God will throw a party for you because he wants you home with him. Now, I know that's the last point, and you guys are putting up your sermon notes and everything, but that's not the end of the sermon or the end of the story. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but this parable ends without a resolution. The story doesn't conclude well, right? We don't know. Does the older brother repent and go into the party? Does the younger brother who came home, does he keep that great attitude or does he turn back into a selfish brat? We don't know. We don't know. You know, Jesus told the story, but he didn't put a bow on the end of it. They didn't all live happily ever after. We just don't know the conclusion. And I think Jesus did that on purpose for us. And we really wouldn't like it if our TV shows ended like this, would we? We want more resolution. Here's why. I think Jesus wanted us to read the story and identify with the story. Find ourselves somewhere in that story. Identify with one of the sons. And then we write the ending. You see, this is our story some way, and we need to write the next chapter. So maybe you've been the rebellious child. So you got to decide, are you going to come home? Are you going to keep on living in the faraway land in poverty? And if you come home, are you going to live as a son or are you going to live as a servant? Are you going to come home and live in your guilt and shame and failure? Are you going to come home and be restored to that place of love and honor and acceptance? Or maybe you identify with the judgmental son. And you got to decide, hey, am I going to stay angry and sit out in the cold while everyone else is celebrating? Or am I going to forgive? Am I going to accept and welcome the sinners home? Am I going to share the Father's joy? Or am I just going to miss out? Or maybe you just got to decide, are you going to join the celebration? You see, the reality is the party is waiting for every one of us, whether we need to come home or we, whether we need to come in. you got to decide what you're going to do today. But I'm telling you right now, Jesus wants you to come home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for grace and mercy and love that is way beyond anything we deserve. You have loved us and demonstrated that love in your sacrifice for our sins. 
And Father, today I pray that your spirit would move in this place and every person here would know that they are loved and valued by you. Regardless of what they've done or where they've been, that you want them to come home and you want to celebrate with them. So let your truth penetrate our lives and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.